Thank you, Vinay. And thank you, everyone else, uh, for attending. And um, thanks for having me as well. I, you know, I had an opportunity to sit in on some of the uh, talks yesterday, and they were very interesting. So I think I learned and took home a little bit from this. So uh, again, my name is Mark Myers. I work as a consultant uh, in this field. Um, and what I'm going to go over today is a workshop on the development and commercialization of innovative ideas. Uh, really, what are the steps that you need to take uh, to take it from concept to a commercialization, commercialized idea, and also some of the pitfalls um, and some of the insights that I've obtained over the course of my career and also in interacting with other people who are entrepreneurs as well. So hopefully this will kind of give you a framework for that. And hopefully it'll be fun too. So if you have any questions, uh, jump in. I got a lot of slides. I'm gonna try to get through them all and, and be on time. So don't feel offended if I maybe hold your question towards the end. And if I can't answer your question, then maybe you should be offended because it's a terrible question. <laughs> Joke, maybe I just can't answer it. So um, this is an interesting anecdote that I, I came across recently. And uh, there's an organization uh, first which really uh, strives to inspire, um, to transform our culture by creating a world where science and technology are celebrated, and where um, the celebrated and where young people dream to become science scientists and uh, technology engineers. Really, their mission statement is to foster this innovative uh, mindset, and so hopefully these people go on to become innovators. Really, really, what has been the backbone backbone of American um, business uh, since its inception. Um, on their board, they have uh, Will I Am, which is the front man for the Black IP. Kind of interesting to have a technology-based organization inventor have a musician um, as one of their directors. He's also on the uh, um, as the director of Intel as well as the uh, director of creative innovation. Now, you can kind of say this is maybe a little spin, PR spin, try to get the company's name out there. But there's also, I think, a good lesson we learned here that. A lot of times, innovative ideas come from the interplay between disciplines. So, uh, you do occasionally see innovations that come from the, you know, mad scientist or, or uh, inventor totally away in his basement. But for the most part, many uh, innovations come from a musician talking to an inventor or a computer software programmer talking to a biologist, and these kind of aha moments happen. So, I really want to stress this. Um, this is a poll that was put together by GE, and they took a look at their uh, executives. They polled them, and they asked, what would, in the next 10 years, drive innovation the most? Now, you see individuals, small contributor, government on our own, small <coughs> contributors, small contributor, large companies, 19% again bigger, small to medium companies, you kind of make sense, you know, this is kind of intuitive that they, they would be a, a larger slice of the pie. But really, the lion's share is a combination of players partnering together. So, so these are universities um, interacting with companies, companies interacting with individuals, this whole interplay where ideas kind of are fostered and fleshed out. Um, in the same uh, study, they also looked at what are the three countries you see as leading innovation. So um, US came in first place, go USA, <laughs> uh, with Germany and Japan, following there shortly thereafter. Um, so why is the U.S. so dominant in innovation? I think that's a good question. I think we can chalk it up maybe to American ingenuity, um, but that falls in the face of some of the reality. A lot of the innovations that come out of the United States are actually from foreigners, people who are not natively born. So maybe it's not this American ingenuity, but maybe it's something to do with the soup that makes America, the whole environment. Um, coming from a financial perspective, Failure doesn't have the same stigma in this country as others. And really, sometimes someone who fails learns a lot more than someone who's successful all the time. So um, this is a really good mindset, and especially as you go through your careers and you have failures, <coughs> think of that as a learning experience too, because sometimes that can be a much more um, dramatic learning experience than, than always having uh, successes. Raising capital is facilitated in this industry, uh, or in this country, um, there's, a, there's a VC community that has a, a good understanding of a lot of technical fields, specialized VC, private equity, really VC is a subset of private equity, um, and also an IPO friendly market. I say this somewhat tongue in cheek because uh, uh, the, the challenges of going IPO in this country have really been 
um, brought up um, in recent, uh, in, in due in large part just to the, uh, the financial cost of going public, all the documentation. But still, you see IPOs coming on the market, even in this troubled market, and just uh, blowing off all expectations. Legal. Um, we have favorable bankruptcy laws, and this kind of gets back into that um, <coughs> thing of failure, where a company or an individual can fail, and bankruptcy laws allow them to survive. They're not dead for the rest of their lives. Um, patent and trademark protection, which is very strong in this country, just allows you basically a monopoly on your idea, and you can go to market when you're against maybe a larger player. Um, educational, institutional, national laboratories. I mean, we're looking at one right now. The Bondi is very well renowned for fostering innovation and connecting um, academics with those outside of that setting. Um, so, and this also uh, uh, fosters a lot of the basic research, which is really, you know, the, the, I, I guess the, 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 the basis for a lot of innovation moving forward. The government, uh, many government programs like the NIH, National Science Foundation, DOD, these are grants that are out there available to innovators um, and inventors and, and kind of get them uh, that first seed capital to take them to the next step. That being said, I uh, just want to go over my agenda a little bit. Um, basically what I'm going to be doing is, is going over in this workshop the steps that someone would take. Uh, and this is particularly from a corporate perspective. What do companies do in terms of the due diligence um, uh, involved with launching a product, launching a project, um, and potentially not launching that or divesting early on? Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about financing, um, give you a brief product development roadmap. Obviously, it's a lot more intricate than what I'm going to present here, but just to give you a rough overview of it and finishing off with the final thoughts. So in terms of due diligence, this is probably the most important part of any um, innovation. Uh, this is the beginning part. And basically what you're trying to do is understand the product within a business model. So how will it work in a current environment? So there's a technical due diligence that needs to be done. This comes pre, uh, this is first and foremost to a lot of scientists and engineers where they're looking at the details of that product, how it may do in a market. Um, and I, I can't stress enough that really if you're going to look at launching a product, it needs to be significantly better than, any, that, than anything else that's out there in whatever feature you're, 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 you're presenting in terms of value proposition. And this is because it takes a long time to get to a product to market. You have to anticipate that your competitors are going to move. And in particularly in the medical field, uh, a lot of times your customers, the adopters, are going to be hesitant to adopt something because there's a lot of risk involved in the medical field. The medical field as a whole is very risk averse for good reason. So you really need to demonstrate a lot of uh, performance characteristics before you should really think about this idea being uh, commercialable. Second, uh, IP. So understand the intellectual property landscape. Uh, are you going to have to license things? Are you going to have to potentially submit multiple patents? This is all involved in, in the initial due diligence. Um, in terms of the market itself, uh, understand the competitive, competitive landscape. Are there people doing the same thing out there already? Is this a completely novel idea? Are you going to be out there on your own? Are you going to be developing a market? So understand that. Understand your user experience. This is probably the most important part. Really know your customer or future customer. Know their pains. Why would they adopt it? Ask yourself this question. Um, what are the incumbent methods being done? I mean, for everything, there's a usual way that it's being done currently. Sometimes there's inefficiencies in that, so maybe that presents you with your opportunity. Probably taking a couple of sips for the rest of this hour. So, assessing the size of the market. Um, uh, this is critical when you're talking to anyone that potentially will invest in your idea, firm, whatnot. In terms of knowing what the market is, have a realistic view of what the market is and what can be your financial return. Um, and also having a realistic uh, as uh, assessment of your market adoption. How quickly is it going to ramp up in a market. And this, there's a lot of variety, there's a variety of ways that it can go. Um, it's good to find a, a surrogate that maybe you can look at similar product and how did they move along this uh, um, product, uh, product adoption value chain. Uh, operational, this kind of gets into the nitty gritty of running a business, suppliers, all that. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that. Regulatory, now this is a very big concern for any medical product that needs regulatory approval. This can be a very expensive process. It's good to have an idea of 
uh, what you're going to need to be able to commercialize this legally in whatever market you're going into. Um, have a good assessment of the costs associated and get someone to speak in this area. Know who you're, you know, have, a, have someone that has a real deep knowledge in this area. And finally, reimbursement. For a lot of products, medical products, reimbursement that is Medicare, Medicaid, insurers really drive your cost basis or your, your, the, the cost basis for them or your price point. So it's important to have a good idea of this moving, uh, going into it. And you can also change reimbursement, but if you need to do that, be conscious of that early on. So that said, uh, on a technical side, so how does the innovation improve upon what is currently being done? As I said before, it really needs to be significantly better. Um, understand what is the current um, paradigm of whatever it may be, whether it be a stent or a medical diagnostic or a drug. Really know how, are, because there is usually a way that, that, that people are being treated um, currently. Um, understand the primary benefits from a medical perspective. So. There's a lot of different ways that you can bring benefits to market, but I really like to distill it down to these two uh, points. Either you're redu reducing the cost to treat that patient, or you're improving patient outcomes. Everything else kind of comes down to these two bases. So if you get an idea of these two, these are really what are gonna drive adoption. So have a good understanding of that, and how your product or innovation will play into that. How far is the concept or prototype from being a scalable product? So, is it an idea? Do you have a prototype? You know, no, and, and this kind of plays into the whole uh, timeline of it. Um, the, also, the farther you are along in terms of developing a prototype, the lower risk you have of it just not working at all. Does the, repro does the product require new technologies to be deployed? So this would be kind of a network effect. Are there technologies that are out there uh, that aren't really haven't been adopted that you'll need to basically um, fall in line, uh, basically to help assist you in commercialization. If they're not well developed and that network is not well developed, you may want to hold that product back for a few years. So a good example, and I, I like to fall back on consumer you know, electronics a lot because um, it's something that everyone knows and understands, but the iPad, for example. Steve Jobs had designs and patents on the iPad long before he ever launched it because he didn't think that the market was ready for it. He needed to take a few steps to develop that market first with other products that he came out with and then they launched it. It was actually designed at the same time as the iPhone, but they held back on that good strategy on their part. So here's just basically a workflow of how you might move from the need to the solution. So at the beginning, really what you're doing is you're gathering customer input. Um, I can't stress enough that you want to spend a lot of time on this step in, in, in the, this chain here. Really, you want to um, gain as much information as possible, understand your customers, understand those who will be a bit, who will be benefited by this, and also those that may be uh, challenged by it. Um, and I'll get into some examples on that later, but um, there's always a loser and a winner when anything new comes out. Um, embed yourself with the potential adopter. So if it's a product that may be um, uh, written prescriptions for in a, in a, in a physician's office, physician's office, like a, a GA. Go in there, spend some time with them, understand how they interact, how they work, are they rushed, are they not rushed, do they take a long time to really review the patient profile before they prescribe this, whatever it may be. If it's a diagnostic test, go to a diagnostic laboratory, understand how they work, really have a good understanding of, of what your customer is doing and how they will potentially use this product. Um, and this basically will help you fully understand the user experience um, Identify pain points within the, the customer itself and also um, identify obstacles early. So if there are going to be challenges, at this point you can still maybe design away from those challenges or look at other strategies that you can circumvent those. It also will help you really identify if this idea is not a good idea. Um, a lot of times inventors fall in love with their own ideas. There's nothing that's more dangerous than that. Um, if they can waste a lot of their own time and capital um, and they're gonna have a very hard time, as passionate as you may be about that particular idea, whoever you're looking to, to fund it, and there's always someone that's gonna be funding, supplying capital, whether that be in a corporate setting, venture capital, whoever, they're really gonna challenge that. So, if you have a good idea early on, maybe now's not the time, but you know, understand what are your potential obstacles and, and if you are gonna be successful. 
So then, generally speaking, in my experience, what you do is you take that customer input. If you decide not to go, then go back to the drawing board for something else. If you decide to proceed, you'll generate what is quote unquote voice of customer. This is generally a document or something that um, can be used to drive product requirements, design blueprints later on in the development chain. So this is where, um, and there, this is, in some ways there's some art to this, where you're taking the input from the customer, interpreting that, and putting that down into a, um, a form that can then be used to then build off of, and also can be used to pitch to whoever may be funding it. So um, you can make mistakes by listening to customers too much, uh, but that's why there's a whole field of market research, primary market research, and these are people that really understand how to filter from what a customer is saying to what they really want. If you ask the customer what they want, they're gonna tell you that they want it to do X, Y, and Z, they want it to brew their coffee in the morning, and they want it for free. Well, they're not gonna be able to get all that. So you want to make them, maybe in your questioning, make them have some um, trade-offs, or, or however you may go about it, and there's a lot of different ways to go about this, to really um, distill this down to a workable set of requirements that you can then take the product requirements and start designing from. So this is again translated from the voice of the customer into what the product will do. Um, this should be done with input from a development team. At this point in particular, you want to have, and let's say that the project champion, it happens to be a marketing person in, in this case. Well, they want to sit down with a group of engineers, operations people, supply chain people, regulatory people, quality control people, and really go through and flesh out what the product is going to look like. Because then you're gonna go back during this development and make sure that you're still building to that. Because you can get creep in a project that will take you from where you thought you were gonna end up, where you end up now. Um, and then finally, the design blueprint. So this is a very specific document, which is really um, intended to um, be designed too. So these are the specifications that go into the product, the real nitty gritty of the parameters. So one of the other areas I mentioned is the legal or intellectual property framework. Are there any attorneys in the audience? No? Has anyone interacted with any attorneys? <laughs> <laughs> Trying to get an attorney to give you a definitive answer on whether or not you can, you can commercialize something is impossible. I guess they're like economists in that regard, where, where they'll say, well, you know, you might be able to do it, you might not. Really, the only way we can tell is in a court of law, so being sued is really kind of the proof of the pudding. And then there's always appeals. So, um, you want to have your best idea of if you have freedom to operate. And this is essentially a snapshot in time of the risk of infringing on someone else's patent that may be out there uh, if you were to commercialize. Um, that said, patenting, and this is something you probably want to do as soon as possible. Um, a patent really is a type of is a proprietary right. Um, a lot of times it's considered a property. Uh, it gives a, the patent holder the right for a limited time to exclude others from making, using, offering to sell, selling, or importing into the United States the subject matter that is within the scope of the protection granted by the patent. In other words, it's a licensed monopoly. Um, basically, this gives you the right to go out there and commercialize it. Um, a patent itself is only as good as your enthusiasm in defending it. So um, you want to bear that in mind also. If, if you have a patent that's out there and you're a very small company, you don't have any resources for an attorney or a staff of attorneys or a law firm, and you have a very large company that's saying, you know, you want to buy your idea, um, you may want to kind of throw it into the mix in terms of your overall decision. <clears throat> There are some ways to patent um, much less expensively, and this is a, um, a provisional application for patents. So this is what you want to do early, as, as early on in the process as possible. This gives you 12-month protection. It's not reviewed, so if you've written this too broadly um, or too, not specifically enough in a particular area or you're overlapping with existing patents, um, it may get kicked out when you file the patent. So, but it will give you 12 months to help you, and it's designed essentially to allow the entrepreneur, the inventor, 12 months to get all their ducks in a row. Um, after that, there's the uh, patent cooperative treaty application, and this is a, if you are looking to global, uh, globally launch a product, um, 
you want to apply for this, there's also for you another 30 months in terms of quote unquote protection. Um, so um, the, 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 the PMP is not published. So you don't have to risk people taking your idea, reading it, and designing something just like it. Um, and also it is based on date. So you get an earlier date in terms of when you filed as opposed to someone that might come in later on, um, later in time. Um, and then finally, you have the non-provisional uh, utility. These are utility patents um, application. This is essentially the patent application. It's a lot more expensive, a lot more goes into it. Um, you need to have uh, very specific claims, drawings. Um, you want to have a patent attorney do this for you. Um, it's fairly involved and in, in, you want to make sure you do it right the first time around. Um, Lastly, on the legal side, um, what I would say is have a non-disclosure agreement in place. So anyone that you're sharing information with, whether they be VCs or other entrepreneurs, uh, anyone you're going to get detailed information on your idea, have them sign a non-disclosure agreement. Because even if you may have a provisional application for patents, if you've not written it right, you may find yourself in a compromised situation uh, if they decide to take your idea, which we hope never happens, but it does. Um, next, I'm going to get to marketing. Now, um, I come from a marketing background, so I'm always very interested in what people think marketing is. A lot of people have a lot of different ideas. Um, the first uh, definition here, and this is from Marketing Defined, my group of smart people, is the process used to determine what product services or services may be of interest to customers and a strategy to use in sales, communication, and business development. I actually like the following um, definition better. Marketing, this is from the marketing, uh, American Marketing Association, AMA, not the American Medical Association. Very different. Um, marketing is an organizational function and set of processes for creating, communicating, and delivering value to customers and for managing customer relationships in ways that, are, that benefit the organization and its stakeholders. So um, I think in this case here, we're going to really focus on the beginning part of this. And, and really what it is is, you know, we're, we're looking at marketing's role in developing a product, understanding the customer, and designing to that need, identifying a need and developing and designing towards that. Here's a cartoon for, and, and, and you know, I see this oftentimes, but basically here, the, you know, I call my invention the wheel, but so far I have been unable to attract any venture capital. He ended up with a square. Um, so this is kind of a, a, you know, an example, classic, not understanding what the market needs and designing to that, or maybe designing and hoping, you know, if you build it, they will come strategy, which sometimes work, but more often than not does not. So what are some of the steps that you might go through uh, from a marketing perspective early on in the process? So what you want to do is identify the need. Um, this is really what's going to drive the value of your product. If there is no need, no one's going to buy it. No one's going to spend something on it. No matter how neat your product concept may be, if there's no need, they're not going to adopt it. So identify the problem. How could the innovation improve upon that problem? Um, and so. This should drive the product, not vice versa. Um, oftentimes, and I've worked in companies before where there'll be skunk works kind of research that's done, and then this is taken and you know hoped to be commercialized. It's very difficult to do that. Really, you want to start with a need and design to that. Um, it's not, um, as my dad would say, the most elegant science, but it is um, important that you know if, if you're trying to develop a product. Um, it's more important to go through that process from need to product. Um, identify your stakeholders. So this is a very important part. You know, who are going to be the beneficiaries? Who may be disadvantaged by the product or innovation when it's launched? Um, a good example of this is, uh, for example, maybe a diagnostic test that's used um, outside of the laboratory in a patient setting or near patient setting. This may be great for physicians because they get information right away. It may be great for patients because they can get their treatment um, prescribed more quickly. But it may also very much negatively impact central laboratories who have a license, their quality assurance people who are also in charge of maintaining laboratory equipment that is outside the lab. So understanding this early on will help 
in devising your strategy, how it's going to be sold, and maybe make some differences in how the product ultimately is developed. Um, define the market. So markets can be defined in many different ways. Uh, geographically uh, is one way. Now, we're living in a much more global society where sometimes these geographical differences are less important, but maybe what's more important is defining the, the market in terms of price sensitivities, is segmenting the market. Regulatory bodies really do define it in the medical field what a market is. Uh, you may need to have a slightly different product for different markets. Um, languages that go on to labeling, um, all that. There's just m many examples of that. Also the distribution channels. Um, you may not be able to directly market your product in a country like Japan because they have a very entrenched distribution uh, or, uh, distribution tradition. So you need to you may need to work with distributors in that case. US, maybe you can sell directly to the customer. Your markets may not. But understand this early on because this will impact your financial modeling. Um, also knowing what the incumbent methods are, technologies that are being used, um, and also you want to map out your competitive landscape. Know who your competitors are, know approximately how much market share they have, are they developing new products that, go, uh, that may launch um, um, in a near term future that may uh, disrupt your plans. Um, so maybe in a little a little more depth in here, uh, how do you obtain this information? So, identification of the need. If, if you're in a corporate, if you work for a company that has existing products, um, really you can get a lot of customer input um, from your sales staff, customer support, technical support. These are the folks on the front line. They really understand, they talk to the customers. You can get a lot of information and it doesn't cost you a whole lot. You just pick up the phone and call them. Uh, if you don't have a product yet, or you're not in a company as of yet, you may want to find other ways to obtain this information, maybe just calling people that you know. Utilize your network. If you know someone who works in an industry or in a similar industry, talk to them. Uh, that really should be your first step. Industry trade groups. Oftentimes, uh, trade shows, trade groups, those folks will tell you what they want. They'll sit there and say, companies, please develop this product. So you can get nuggets of information that way. Market research. Now, this is a more active type of research. Uh, generally, it's broken out into two different kinds. Primary market research, um, which is also known as field research, and secondary market research, which is also known as, referred to as desk research. Um, primary market research can be very expensive, but I can't stress enough how important it is. It really helps you understand your customers. So, observe uh, potential customers' workflow. Um, depending on what the product is, if it's an implantable device, you want to maybe sit in on a surgery and, and understand how that product is being used um, and how your, your product would fit into that. How existing products are being used and how your product would fit into that. Um, key opinion leaders, talk to them. They should be the first people that you're talking to. They're generally the visionaries. They have a good idea of what could happen in the next 10 years. Um, so, and this is also a good opportunity that if you are later on going to market and develop this product, um, they should be the, your early adopters, and they should be the ones that are on board with your product. Um, they can basically be your best friend or your worst enemy if you don't court them appropriately. Surveys are another good way. Um, you know, if they're trade groups or, or large seminars, it's a good opportunity to have a lot of people with a lot of concentrated information. You can conduct surveys, find out more quantitative data about the market, what they're using, market share. So this is important information to gather. And then lastly, focus groups. Focus groups are very important and very good at really drilling down. So you can ask questions, you can, generally what I like to do is do a survey first. I, I kind of work through this stepwise in terms of having key opinion leader input, then surveys, then a focus group where you can really drill down and flesh out some of the questions that you have. And then you may want to reiterate this and go, go back through this process again. Secondary market research, basically what you're doing is you're finding out what's currently out there. So publications, um, census data, um, American Marketing Association publishes a lot of data. Um, there's a lot of information, particularly in healthcare, about disease states, the number of people being treated, the number of prescriptions that are written for any particular areas. Uh, so you want to do that, um, and a lot of that information is fairly accessible. Other market, uh, secondary market research reports. These are off-the-shelf, Frost and Sullivan type reports. They can be expensive. Sometimes they don't know what you're talking about. Sometimes they do. It's good to read them. Even if they, even if you identify that this particular market research is not that valid, 
you've read it, you've gone through that exercise and it improves your, your knowledge base. Um, analyst reports, you can get information on what your competitors are doing, their market share, their revenues, how many units are being sold of, of whatever particular product. So a lot of times you can kind of get this information from these sources. Generally speaking, it's a little less expensive way to do it. You don't have to leave your office, um, but it should be part of the overall um, customer input. Um, input from sales and customer support, I already discussed. So taking all this information, the next step, what you're gonna wanna do is size the market. So a good idea of what is the size of the market that you're looking to play into. So um, generally speaking, it's kind of broken out into top-down approach and bottoms-up approach. Uh, so a top-down approach, um, a good example of this is basically uh, constructing a model of the market itself. So you'll maybe start with census data and work down into that particular market that you plan on working into. Um, this works well when there's little data available on a market because it's a completely innovative idea and there's um, no real um, anecdotal information out there. You may need to contrive a model that represents that market. Um, they're not always the most accurate. Um, a bottom up, bottoms up approach generally it, it has more rigor to it, but um, I think generally speaking, the best way to do it is do both. You triangulate between both of them. Um, and so I'm just gonna give you a quick example of a top down approach. So basically what you wanna do is, is break out the market in terms of total or potential available market. Uh, this is sometimes uh, uh, um, omitted from a, a model. But basically, this is the potential market would have if it were to grow. Total available market is the, uh, the size of the market as it is now. So this would be all your competitors um, in a particular, um, let's say, sector. Um, serve or service available market, now you're focusing in on where your technology would fit. And lastly, service, serviceable attainable market. And this is a realistic um, look at the market share that could be attained by your company uh, through your existing channels, market influences. So this is a little bit more internal. Um, so uh, an example, this would be a, an example of how you might construct this. Um, and just to kind of walk you through this, maybe let's take um, HIV diagnostic testing or, or HIV testing as a whole. So the, 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 the PAM in this case may be all diagnostic test, testing that potentially could occur in whatever geography, maybe this is globally, right? Uh, you look into total available market, this would be the current amount of testing that's being done. That's maybe limited by the amount of money available to do the testing. You can't have a total available market which is greater than all the market, all the money that's being spent on in the medical field as a whole. So um, you, you want to use some logic there. Um, then looking at maybe these two SAMs, maybe you have here um, um, viral load testing for, diagno for, for measuring the amount of viral, viral particles a particular person has in their blood, blood at any time, which is used in treat current treatment. And you may have diagnostic testing, which is determining whether that person has that disease or not. Maybe different markets, but they're in a similar area. And then finally, uh, the, the serviceable, obtainable market, that might be the limitations on your technology. So maybe for diagnostic testing, you might have molecular-based testing methods, and you may have uh, antibody-based testing methods. Different technologies, maybe you're tied in slightly different ways, they don't overlap, but they're two discrete markets. So it just helps you work through what you think the market will be, and this will be important in terms of later on when you are assessing the potential revenue that your product may generate. So um, in terms of bottom-up approach, generally what you want to do is uh, take a look at the revenue data from other firms. I generally like to start from units and then um, work into revenue. So in this case, you may start with revenues, that is how, many, uh, how much money company X is making in this particular, this particular product, have an estimate of how much they make per unit that they sell, and then you contrive from that how many units are being sold by that company in that particular area. Generally speaking, they're not gonna tell you, so you kinda have to um, estimate this yourself. Um, and this works best when there are maybe a few players in a space that have, uh, and if they're publicly traded, they have to disclose a lot of this, so it, it works well here. So for example, firm one may have revenues of this, firm two may have revenues of that. You add those two together, you have total revenue in the market. 
you take the total revenue and assumption on what is the average unit price, and then you have the average number, and then you have the number of units in that market. And what you can kind of then do is compare that to your top-down approach, or in the same ballpark, if you're not, maybe you need to go back and, and pass those things out some more. But it's a good double check if you use both. So estimating market adoption. Um, this is probably a, this is probably a more difficult aspect because what you're trying to do is forecast what your sales are going to be for a product that does not currently exist. Um, there's a couple different <coughs> models which are used. Um, it's good to find maybe a, a product that's similar to that surrogate that you can kind of use to estimate how you will flow through this uh, continuum. But this is basically used to forecast demand and adoption. Um, two of the models which are used, one is a, a Everett and Rogers model, diffusion of innovations, and the other one is a fast diffusion model, which takes into account a couple other variables. Um, again, use a surrogate for uh, very innovative products. So basically, when you look at diffusion of innovations, um, this is generally the way um, these have been characterized. So at the beginning, you have your innovators, followed by your early adopters, early majority, late majority, and laggers. So the blue line is basically um, your, your, your uh, percentage of market share in each one of these. And then the gold line is the, basically the cumulative um, uh, um, market share of the market itself. So as you move through this, you gain more market share, um, and this is basically your, your net change, your rate of change uh, that the blue line is. So at the beginning, you have a, 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 a flat line where you're trying to gain traction in the market. At a certain point, it starts to hockey stick, and you start to gain traction in that market. As more and more people are adopt the product, it's proven in the market. Some of the, um, let's say, some of the, uh, factors that may prevent early majority and late majority adopters from um, um, uh, adopting your product or have been worked through and then finally have uh, at, the, at the end of this is when your product, essentially at this point your product is starting to become somewhat um, commoditized and most innovative companies will try to develop another product and have another one in the pipeline that will extend this line out and also because what happens is you get some price erosion at this point, products become less profitable. I think I have a room full of engineers here, so I had to throw up one equation. <laughs> this is for the vast diffusion model. So uh, this is a model that is used to really uh, estimate the probability of purchase at time t. So this will also uh, give you a curve, essentially. Um, you have a coefficient of rate of innovation. This is essentially um, uh, a, a, a variable that's used to plug into this that um, uh, will it basically is impacted by your marketing advertising efforts. Um, coefficient and rate of uh, imitation, this is the effect that you have from word of mouth, so kind of that connectivity. So um, a good example is, um, let's say durable goods, industrial durable goods, um, generally will have a larger um, Q <coughs> than P. And um, consumer durable goods, on the other hand, iPhones or whatever, have a larger P, than, uh, not larger P than Q, but larger relative to other products. Um, and so you can use these to basically help get an estimate of, of how quickly your product will be adopted, because that, that the unit sold really drives the, the profitability of any product, probably more than anything else. Maybe the cost of the product as well per unit. But, um, so basically, this is what these coefficients do. Shifted to the right, um, the high coefficient of innovation shifts the adoption curve to the left. Low shifts the curve to the right. The coefficient of limitation really um, increases um, on the on the y-axis. Um, this has also been used to characterize some of the challenges early on. Um, there's a book by Moore, um, which I encourage everyone to read. Um, but basically, what it, it, he really focuses on. Um, consumer electronics and software, um, but it has applications in medical device uh, in, in some instances. But, um, and I'm just gonna flip to the next slide just to give you a preview of it. This is the chasm, uh, as it were. Um, and this is basically the point at which um, many products fail. And, and the reason that they fail is that um, um, many of these products 
Um, they focus a lot on the innovators. Innovators are those uh, visionaries. They're maybe willing to trade some of the risk of adopting a product, um, but um, the early adopters are those that need some network effects um, and also lower risk in terms of adopting a product. In the medical field, you have a lot of very risk averse people. So what often happens is, and, and for a variety of reasons, but often what happens is you focus so much on your innovators and capturing that beginning part of the, uh, of the curve that the early adopters, some of the factors that would influence them to make that purchasing decision, um, I don't want to say neglected, but maybe you're not focused in on as much and a product fails at this point. So um, what you need to do and be conscious of is that these later adopters are much more risk averse. These might be your corporate buyers or larger institutions that have purchasing agents, CFOs, those people that are maybe more cost conscious, economic buyers. So you want to understand that and quickly, as quickly as possible address them once you start selling your product and you start to see a little bit of traction. Um, so you want to know, so, so these folks really require an established network as well. So whether that be um, proof that the product works, demonstrated um, um, proof of concept and proof of product, also, or if it's a product that requires some network effects also. So connectivity, this is why it really is applicable in a lot of ways to IT, where connectivity is so important. Uh, you can kind of replace that in the medical field with uh, risk associated with adopting a product. So uh, the risk aversion there is in, in the field as a whole. Um, these folks are also much more price sensitive, so be aware that as you scale up, you may want to adjust your price. Hopefully your time to the scale will be in line such that you're still profitable. Um, and um, regulatory or market support and or endorsement of those innovators. So you want to be conscious of them all through that continuum, but these are the two groups that you really want to focus on. Understand your customer. Again, I can't stress this enough. So um, generally speaking, I think as you're moving through this, um, you focus on your innovators before your product is developed. Once your product is launched, immediately start focusing on your early adopters. If you get through that chasm and the early part of that, and you start to get into the early majority, at that point your product may begin to start to sell itself. It's been proven, um, it's establishing a reputation, and at that point you should be focusing on efficiencies in your operation, sales force, all that. So the focus becomes less on market development and more on operational efficiency. That said, um, the regulatory environment is uh, one that is uh, can be a, a real challenge for any medical product. So does the product require any type of regulatory approval? Um, you want to know this early on. Um, you know, in different markets, for example, in Europe, the regulatory requirements and submissions may be very different than in the US. So be aware of that and work with a professional, someone who really knows, someone who has contacts and has done this before. This is very important because uh, who, the, 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 the person who receives your regulatory submission is the person that's going to accept it. So if they have a personal relationship with someone on your regulatory staff, that will facilitate lines of communication. So, so don't underestimate those relationships. Um, this is also important to assess the time to market. This will go into your financial modeling to really know if it can be profitable or not. Um, estimate the cost uh, to gain approval and reassess the um, return on, on investment and also the net present value of going to market. Reimbursement. Um, so this is another uh, driver of profitability and, and revenues. Um, medical reimbursement really drives uh, um, pricing for many many diagnostic products and medical devices. There are very few that are uh, purchased by the patients themselves. So, and if they are, they're probably, there's gonna be a lot more price sensitivity. So understand this. So the key questions here, does this, does Medicare currently reimburse for this technology? Medicare really does drive what a lot of insurance companies will do. So it's important in understanding that. There are also government agencies, so they're gonna be a lot more willing to share information. Good luck in getting any information from an insurance company because they won't talk to you and not give you any information. You may want to use a consultant in this case. Um, are, do, do the, um, does the product require a new uh, um, CPT code? So uh, a CPT code is generally used in diagnosis, 
treatment, um, and if you if, if the CPG code currently exists, you're going to have a real good idea of what your revenues will be, assuming there's not any change in that reimbursement for that CPG code. So um, that's kind of the best case scenario. Worst case scenario, it does not exist. You need to work with these uh, agencies to develop one. So um, it runs the gamut. You can have all kinds of, uh, of, of differences there, but you want to understand where you are and where you're going to uh, need to go to. Um, will insurers pay for it? Good question. That could really drive uh, your, your uh, revenues one way or the other. So all that being said, you basically take all that information and put it into your financial model. So um, within this, generally the way uh, I approach this, and I think a lot of um, say corporate uh, project managers would approach this, is they take all this information, they model it, and they then come up with a return estimate, whether it's be a net present value or return on invested capital. Um, and then what I generally do is I take that number, um, stress it for, let's say, a more optimistic case, but that's not really a stressor, that's optimistic. Stress it for a more pessimistic case. So you really drive down all those variables and see if it still can make money. If it can, then that's a good sign. Um, if you're talking to a venture capitalist, they're going to want to see this. So um, understand the numbers behind it. Also understand some of the risks. Um, generally speaking, that doesn't account for all the risks. So you may want to take that whatever figure you get and run into another simulator or model that represents the market um, risks associated with it. So some of these risks are the probability of technical risks or technical success. Maybe the product can't be developed the way you want it to be. Um, probability of uh, regulatory success. This is another question mark. Are you going to be successful? Um, are you going to have to go back and redo a clinical trial? That might blow your expense line. Um, probability of commercial success. This is basically what we've been talking about. The more you understand your customer, the better chance you have of knowing whether or not you're going to be commercially successful. Time to market. Um, in any kind of calculation, as we're looking at, you know, you're getting investment at this point, and you're getting a return at this point. Uh, the point between those two um, is, a, is, a, is a big driver for loss. So you want to make sure that your time to market, your estimates are accurate. You want to make that as short as possible. So take as much time as you can up front in understanding the market and in as little time as possible in developing a product, but make a good product. Um, market value, uh, again, this goes into the model, you know, I think we address that. And also the investment, where are you going to get the capital? Are you going to have to pay some venture capitalists their usual 10 and 20? Um, are you getting bank loans and then you're increasing your, 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 your cost of capital? So you want to have at least an idea of this. So this is kind of the nitty gritty of financial modeling. So what you're calculating here and what I generally use is a net present value for the project. Um, and, and this is essentially a, a discounted cash flow. Discounted meaning you take your time and your cost of capital and you discount your future cash flows against that number. Um, so what you're going to need uh, to basically do this calculation is an estimate of the project development costs. Um, what you can sell the product for, AUP is a term that's used to describe that. Uh, the cost of goods sold, so understanding how much it's going to cost per unit once you're scaled up in manufacturing. Maybe a little bit during the uh, beginning part, but really what you're looking at is when you're operating, you're making these things at, a, at an efficient um, level, what are your costs of, of each one of those? Overhead costs, so this is payroll, uh, property plant, plant and equipment, um, having the lights on, all those things are your overhead costs, which need to be uh, levied against the, the project itself. Startup and development costs. So this is everything that goes into all the stuff I just talked about. Um, all that analysis goes in here. For a medical uh, product, uh, usually your startup costs are very significant. Um, I come from a diagnostics industry. We can manufacture something for a dollar, sell it for fifty dollars. That's a huge uh, margin. But the cost to develop that product may be twenty, thirty million dollars. So you know, you need to sell a lot of units to make up for that initial uh, investment. Uh, the development timeline and launch timelines. This will go into that calculation as well. Again, time is money in this case. Uh, and then your terminal value. So when you run through this, you want to have an estimate of what the, let's say at the end of the, your time horizon, be that 10 years, maybe that's your, your plan to go public. What is going to be the value of that product 
at the end of that time horizon and use that basically fold that into the calculation. Some of the ways of innovation are basically those people who are willing to maybe give you money and not ask for it back, or at least not ask for it back until you can give it back. Uh, angels are a type of investor. A lot of times they have altruistic motives, but they're willing to give you uh, money to see the venture, be flexible on the terms, and maybe they maybe they see something in this innovation. You need to be very passionate when you're speaking to any of these people, but. Um, this is really the first place you should be looking for uh, capital. Uh, small business administration loans um, is another place. And these, these are programs that are in place to help stimulate the economy. Utilize those. Bootstrapping. I put this before venture capital for a good reason. Um, I think any company that can really keep its costs down at the beginning, uh, maybe you are negotiating with your suppliers in such a way that you know when you're going to start seeing revenues, and you can delay the, some of those expenses as much as possible. Um, asking employees to take smaller pay, uh, 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 salaries in exchange for maybe some of the, the equity stake or bonuses later on down the line. But really keeping your costs down as much as possible are going to be good. It's going to help you also if you do need to get venture capital that they see that you're very cost conscious because they don't want to see their investment blown. Um, but venture capitalists, they are going to, if you do need venture capital, and generally speaking, as you move down, you, you, you've established that your product is going to work and you're looking maybe to go public, that's when uh, venture capital can be very valuable, their advice can be valuable, but oftentimes they take a managing, they really want to take a managing role within your, uh, within your organization. So they're going to start telling you what to do. You may or may not be comfortable with that. Um, two, they're going to ask, they want money. You know, they're in the business of making investments. VCs make a lot of investments and they need to see a high return on any potential successful ones because they may be losing on the ones that are not successful. So, be, you know, uh, that in mind, realize that generally speaking as a rule of thumb, uh, they want to get 2% annualized from each year's cash flows and they also want to see about 20% return um, at the end of the whatever their investment horizon is. So, you want to avoid that as much as possible. I'm getting the five minute sign, so I'm going to move through some of these slides. Uh, what I'd like to do is um, quickly go through a, a development process. And, and, and I think, you know, if you have any questions about the VC side or any of that, just come and ask me afterwards. But how do you develop a product? Um, I can't stress enough that you need to have a formalized process for this. So this is very important. Um, and generally speaking, you want to have phases that you move through. Uh, a good example um, is, is something like this. Now, it, it might vary from, from product to product, but you move from concept to investigational phase to a modeling phase where you're developing a prototype. Pre-production, where you're getting ready to scale up, launch, post-production, uh, which is also uh, maybe you could say uh, uh, post-launch surveillance period where you're kind of assessing how the product is going to do in the market itself. Um, and if you're getting any feedback about the product tweaks that you can make later on down the line, and then you might end this process. For a lot of medical products, uh, many of the documents that go into each one of these phases are auditable. So be conscious of that. They need to be clean, they need to be concise, um, streamlined, don't have too many. Just, just, this is where your quality affairs folks weigh in. Uh, document everything. Um, and this is how each phase might look, where you have a checklist, you have a goal for each phase, you go through an uh, analysis of that, and um, at the end you basically get a no, go, no, go decision. Go, no, go, or hold. It's kind of hard to read the, the one in yellow. But basically, those are the basically um, decisions that can be made at the end of each phase. So I'm just going to walk you through each one of these quickly. The concept phase basically is when you're taking the voice of customer document and um, translating that into some of the specifications. You're also being used using this time to pitch the product concept to whoever it may be. Uh, so you want to assess the market, have a good understanding of where you are, your initial uh, freedom to operate, um, estimates on the cost of produce per unit, um, regulatory assessments, product development timeline, the resource requirements you'll need, uh, performance specifications. You want to do all the financial analysis at this point and file a patent. Uh, again, some of this information may or may not be uh, 
uh, audible by the FDA, you want to know if it is. Generally speaking, a business case, and this is what this is, a business case is not reviewed by the FDA, but anything past that is. So investigation phase here, you're essentially uh, digging into the technical parameters of it, and you want to be basically devising a project plan. Um, begin identifying some of the study sites. So these are the alpha, beta sites where you're going to have customers going over the product, seeing if it works. You also want to start identifying your potential clinical study sites uh, early on. And develop, begin developing a marketing plan. Who are going to be your early adopters? You may want to start talking to them, supporting them. Uh, this is a good time also when if it's a scientific type product and there's an industry trade group like that, you may want to start publishing. Generate some documents or some, some papers that demonstrate the merits of your, your particular innovation. You may want to collaborate with the university for this. Um, Next phase is the model phase. So basically here what you're looking to do is develop a prototype. So you're working through the product itself, you've kind of gotten that uh, design blueprint, and you're going that into a product. Um, you may have to do, make some changes. You want to review this versus your customer requirements. Um, also you want to start beginning to look at the manufacturability of the product, quality control, supply chains, uh, scale of plans. If you have suppliers upstream that you need to start building relationships with because they're going to be selling you, you want to build those relationships, let them know about your plan so they can supply you with what you need uh, to make the product. Um, and then review the marketplace again to ensure that the target, your customer that is, has not changed. Um, here also you want to basically um, begin alpha testing of the product because it's not too late to make changes with the product at this point. Um, you want to define um, the manufacturing and service requirements for a product. If you are going to sell, direct sell, how are you going to support this product once it's out in the market? Um, you want to begin the uh, commercialization plan as well. So are you going to have sales staff, customer support folks, all this kind of nitty gritty of running a business starts to come into play. Um, uh, this is, we're coming here to the end of the development cycle, and this is the pre-production phase. So at this point, you want to have an understanding of the, the manufacturing protocols. This want to be finished. Um, quality control protocols, how are you going to be able to test for the quality of the product? All this will need to be documented. And again, this can all be reviewed by the FDA, so it needs to make sense. It needs to have a logic, and it needs to have a process behind it. They're very much process-driven. So. You can't just use logic to explain things. You have to have a process in place to begin with and then show that you follow that uh, process all the way through. Um, establish operations protocols, inventory management, supply chain, shipping, all these things are going to running a company. At this point, hopefully you have a COO, a chief operating officer, that understands this side of the business. Uh, validate the product against the the customer requirements, make sure it is meeting those. And review market assumptions to ensure that the product will meet current customer needs. Um, I think here, basically, the, the important parts I want to focus in on here is that um, this is when your regulatory submissions will go out. So um, at this point, you should have a regulatory staff that can handle this, that can start understanding what kind of clinical trials, if you need to have them, clinical studies, if you need to have them, how they need to be structured, and how they're going to go out. Um, all the customer facing documents need to be made, brochures, user manuals, um, complete your marketing plan, be ready to train your sales staff, support staff, um, and you may begin your advertising activities at this point. And then the final milestone uh, within beginning, I guess the first phase of this process is launching a product. Generally that's defined by getting a customer to buy. At this point, maybe you're getting a lot of stuff away, but if you want to start thinking about making uh, 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 profit here. Um, post launch surveillance, this is generally a product a lot of FDA approved products. Basically you want to validate that the product is being manufactured as it was intended. You're not getting any manufacturing errors, you're able to support it, um, and you want to really review also at this point for internal information how the project worked at this point. So did the team execute efficiently, were there significant delays, you can learn a lot, like a lessons learned. Um, um, at this phase, and um, this year would last anywhere from six months to a year, and then you've got a product that's out there. So, final thoughts here I just want to leave you with. Um, in this whole process and everything I've, I've gone over here, 
Really what you want to do is you want to stay abreast of current developments in the stakeholder networks. So know what's going on, know who your stakeholders are, are there changes in the regulatory environment, are new products coming out. You really want to know, go to trade shows, but really understand the market. Um, be where the action is. Um, markets tend to, generally tend to cluster in areas, for example, Silicon Valley for IT and software, San Diego for biotech. So it really helps to position yourself in that area. If you're going to be starting a company and hiring people, you're not going to have to move them. There's already the VCs that are involved in this are there. So it really helps if you are in an area where um, this type of activity is going on. Be adaptable. Markets change. Be prepared to change yourself. Products may need to change, meaning you need to come out with reiterations of the product. Um, don't underestimate the value of the connectivity of individuals. So hire and surround yourself with people who have industry experience. <coughs> this is also valuable. Um, all those soft knowledge soft knowledge that, that, that individuals may have through their experiences, their network, past work, this can be very valuable in making your company successful. And then be holistically conscious of the entire system and how your product and service fits into that system. So understand how your product is being used because mistakes can happen if you don't. Um, so that's basically it. I have some acknowledgments, acknowledgements here, um, but they don't support any questions today. Thank you. Thank Yeah. <clears throat> Could you uh, explain more specifically what you do on a daily basis and how you got to be in that position? Well, um, sure. Uh, basically what I do is I consult um, companies and, and individuals who are looking to commercialize products um, in, in a variety, taking my background in, in, in consideration. So I work in a variety of, I guess, commercial side of, of medical device and, and medical, I guess, life science products, uh, products of that nature. So, um, you know, I worked in a lab, I've got a technical background, I went to business school and basically migrated from a laboratory environment, worked in sales and, and ended up in business development and strategic marketing. So that's kind of my uh, steps I took in my career. Um, but um, am, am I answering your question? Yeah, I think that's kind of it. And then, okay. So you basically, you uh, worked in a technical field and you moved across to get experience in the world. Generally speaking, in this field, the medical field, you, you need to have some kind of technical background and technical experience. I mean, you know, some people think that, you know, uh, a lot of these skills are very portable, but kind of getting back to what I was saying before, you know, having that connectivity, knowing the people in the industry, kind of as your career matures and you have those peers of yours that work in a certain area, you still have those relationships. I think those are all uh, valuable. Um, a lot of people go from technical to more business <coughs> side. I don't see too many people going the other way, but I think it's just because of the amount of jobs <laughs> that you have. <laughs> well, I know we're a little behind schedule, Mark. That was an amazing summary of, of commercialization. And no, in such a short period of time. Um, most people do either a year or at least uh, at least at least a full semester or quarter, and I was told by someone who's in MBA school currently that you hit the high levels of what what what, what they wish they could have just gotten in the short summary of, right, the clip notes. So um, we'll definitely be looking forward to having you come back and do um, maybe a more extensive workshop for a longer period of time directly with some of Mark Gordon's scholars, because some of them already have some ideas in um, IP and when do you start to convert are definitely some questions. So um, I'm thinking maybe around the spring, we'd love to have you back. So maybe we can talk and see if that's possible. Um, get them some more developed in their ideas. So. Sure, and, and if anyone has any other questions, follow-up questions that you think of later, uh, you feel free to get my contact information from Evan A. I can also give you my card later. I'll be around for a little bit, so feel free to ask me any questions if you have them. Yeah, thank you. And you can bombard him for a little bit. We're going to take a five-minute break. Um, I think without looking at my calendar, that means we're going to we're exactly 10 minutes behind schedule. We'll be back at 10:30. <laughs>